if you're walking around the world basically believing you're not enough or you're not worthy, think about how that impacts work, relationships, even family, you know, your day-to-day. Welcome back to the First Gen Healing Podcast, a podcast on Latinx healing and awakening journeys. Today, we are doing a part two with Lupita Martinez, a Latina therapist who works with the BIPOC community, specifically on the experience of the imposter syndrome. Is it phenomenon? Phenomena? Phenomenon. Yeah, technically it's phenomenon, phenomenon not syndrome, but... The imposter phenomenon. There we mm-hmm. go. <laughs> All right. And so in part one, we learned about Lupita's story. In this episode, we get to hear from her about her area of expertise, which I'm really excited about because I have a feeling that a lot of first gens experience this. But first of all, how are you, Lupita? Welcome. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, trying to wake up here a little bit because I was up a li- uh, <laughs> I was up late with the kiddo this uh, last night, so we'll we'll get there. We'll get through the day today. I'm sure the listeners <laughs> appreciate your presence. So yeah, thank you so much for <laughs> for pushing through. <laughs> and um, so it's imposter phenomenon, not imposter so, syndrome. So it, it it's used interchangeably. There's no like official name for it. I think people try to now researchers are trying to push for imposter phenomenon just because when you mm. name it a syndrome, it almost kind of sounds like there's something wrong with you, right? Like, un syndrome, like it's a syndrome. Yeah. Um, okay. Versus phenomenon makes it feel a little bit more like something that people just kind of experience, right? Like, it's an experience mm. versus like a an illness of some sort. Ooh, that makes sense. Okay. The only thing is phenomenon to me sounds like extraordinary or como que algo, you know, that doesn't really, uh-huh. yeah, exactly. <laughs> So maybe can you explain to us the difference between how someone might experience imposter phenomenon versus what it actually is, if there's a difference? So people that experience imposter phenomenon don't necessarily feel like they are worthy or they, they've achieved anything. So even though they're really amazing people, they have all the accreditations, they have all the degrees, they have all these things they still don't necessarily feel like they were enough or like they they don't necessarily belong. A lot of times they kind of dismiss their achievements. So they might say like, oh, you know, it was just good luck or, you know, people actually helped me out. They kind of just like minimize all the hard work that they've actually done. And so part of imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon is that they, they have all the amazing qualities they just don't fully believe that they achieved them on their own or that they, they were worthy of, 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 of achieving those things. So they tend mm-hmm. to kind of second guess where they are. So you see that a lot with like high achieving people where they don't necessarily feel like I should I should be here. Like it, I shouldn't be here. Like everyone else does so much better than me. So you see a lot of comparison mm-hmm. uh, between yourself and other people. I see. And so that's the actual experience of it, right? Like experiencing it. Mm -hmm. Now, is it different of what it actually is? Like maybe a combination of emotion, beliefs, like is it something chemically within our body that happens? I guess what is it actually? So imposter phenomenon is kind of like this experience, right? And it can be both uh, cognitively, physically, because if you really think about mental health in general, not saying that imposter syndrome is mental health, but when you think about our experience, right? We experience mm-hmm. things is very holistically, right? We see, we feel, we smell, we touch, we, you know, all these different sensations. And so mm-hmm. I like to think about imposter syndrome as um, something that you experience both cognitively, physically, um, and emotionally as well. And so when mm-hmm. we're working on it in therapy, it's a combination of all of that. Right. We're not just working on the experience and how you experienced it and what what's triggered that experience or what happened at that moment. We're also thinking about how has that um, played a part in like your life, like imposter phenomenon, like how has it been influenced by your upbringing? Um, So we're really kind of looking at the like deeper root of imposter phenomenon. Mm hmm. 
I wonder if a lot of high achievers don't consider themselves high achievers since mm. they downplay <laughs> mm-hmm. that. So they might not self-identify. What are some ex- examples of high achievers? Because maybe they are one, but they're like, no, no, I haven't achieved anything, you know, extraordinary. So I'm not that. Yeah. Well, I mean, even think about people like that are like in really badass positions, right? Like you have people that work in the industry and and that have worked all their lives and they've kind of like built built a name for themselves. Uh, even if you don't necessarily have a degree, like if you are like basically in this in a position where where not everyone can be in that position, I consider those people being high achievers because it's like you literally got that job because of your qualifications but somehow you still don't believe that you got that job because of that qualifications or same thing like if you experience like let's say imposter phenomenon when it comes to like being a a a a mother or a you know like something outside of work right Mm because really it's about the experience of feeling like a fraud like you're feeling like a fraud even though you actually excel at at this thing right Mm -hmm. and you compare yourself Mm -hmm. to other people but you actually do um, compare. It's just you don't see yourself as being being equivalent. I see. I like that you bring that up. So it's not necessarily just like position oriented, because I think that's what most people might think of, like mm-hmm. academically or professionally. But you said like maybe motherhood. Do people experience it in relationships? If you experience imposter phenomenon in a relationship, then maybe it would be more like, well, everyone else has this partner. Right. And I don't necessarily have a partner. So do I am I really worthy of a partner? Um, do I really belong with a partner? Um, you know, maybe I'm not enough. Like and so there's a lot of like feeling like an imposter, even in the dating world where you feel like you're kind of mm-hmm. faking it and you're not really being your authentic self and like all these different things. When in reality, like you're actually a pretty good catch and you pre- you 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 meet all the qualifications for people and people are like oh you're this and all oh, you're that and you're like oh no i don't really think i'm attractive or i don't really think i'm a good catch and so you're kind of second guessing that too like i would say that this would also be an experience of imposter phenomenon mm-hmm. you're just like literally feeling like an imposter yeah I wonder Mm -hmm. even to like being in relationship, but thinking you don't deserve that type of person, right? Like, Mm -hmm. oh, would you say that that aligns with imposter phenomenon? Yeah. So one of the things that I really enjoy about working with them with clients that experience imposter phenomenon is that you see that this kind of leaks into other parts of your life. Because I I think this goes with like the deeper rooted issue here, which is I'm not enough or I'm not worthy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about that, if you're walking around the world basically believing you're not enough or you're not worthy, think about how that impacts work, relationships, even family, even, um, you know, your day to day. Like You don't yeah. feel enough. You mm-hmm. don't feel worthy. And so you're literally walking around that world with that belief. Mm-hmm. Okay. So would you say that most people who experience this, there's a deeper root that, that I, goes, I fully um, believe that. Yeah, I fully believe that. Okay. I don't think that it's something that, and this, that's one of the things that I really enjoy about working with it in therapy is that you see connections, right? It's like almost kind of like a web, right? You're moving one little piece mm-hmm. of the web and the whole web moves because you're noticing yeah. that there's different pivotal points in your life where you experience that feeling of not being enough or that feeling of not being worthy of something, um, that mm-hmm. feeling of not being deserving of something. And so I, I fully believe that, yes, it is something that you experience um, even into the into childhood, right? As I hear you speaking, it, my whole thing is authenticity. So that's like kind of like what I work with people on. It's sounding mm-hmm. to me like there's also that might come up in your sessions, right? Because there's this space between like, who they who one thinks they need to be to deserve or to be accepted versus who they actually are some of the clients are in therapy with me sometimes they come into therapy like basically with this like guard right of like they need to be they need to show up as like this perfect person or this person that's like very like guarded um and so if they show their flawed version, then they're not necessarily like enough, right? And so it's a lot of us trying to break down those barriers of like, okay, how does this connect? Okay, what's going on here? Uh, Cause you're coming to therapy for a reason, but you may come up, you know, like, oh, well, I don't really know what to say, or I don't really know what to do. Or um, I see how I'm, I'm like not really 
connecting with uh, people at, at work or at school and, and I'm feeling like a fraud, but then I'm like, okay, well, how does that connect or how does that relate to maybe your relationships? Like, do you feel like you're connected with other people around, you know, at home or within your friendships? Uh, you just kind of see it leak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe like plugging you a little bit as a therapist, at what point do people typically come to you for therapy? Because I imagine like if I'm feeling like an imposter, I wonder like how do people come across your work? Because I don't know that I would be like, hmm, maybe I need therapy for this, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering like, yeah, how, what do you think like triggers that? So I think because I, um, do advertise myself as someone that that works with imposter phenomenon a lot of the people that come to me are very much like people in that have come across issues in the workplace so i work with a lot of people who are ceos who are like fully badass people um Mm -hmm. they just have a really hard time really grasping that and really kind of uh showing up authentically in those roles and feeling really confident in those roles And so a lot of the things that we're working on is really trying to figure out, like, what is impacting your inability to to really fully be that authentic version of yourself as a supervisor, as a CEO, as some like big honcho administrative person. Um, Mm -hmm. So usually it kind of starts there. Then they're like, okay, I came for this for like to work on these things. And all of a sudden, we're talking about childhood. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's kind of what happens. <laughs> so it ends up being like, I kind of like end up catching them, uh, you know, when they're trying to work over the surface. And then we're like really teaching yeah. them like, okay, it's a little bit more than just this over the surface stuff. It's a little deeper. Mm-hmm. And do, are they receptive to that? Because I feel like if it's like this badass, you know, <laughs> person walking around, they're like, no, I don't need to work on that. <laughs> Well, it's, we don't really jump into it like that, right? Like we are working yeah. on like the day to day, and then as we're kind of going deeper, um, I mean, you see it because we're doing EMDR, right? And so as we're doing EMDR mm. on imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon, like a lot of things come up, um, and you'll see how it's related. Oh, so that's I the see. really cool okay. part, yeah. Like that you're you're doing something open ended, and it's actually on them because I'm not really doing like EMDR is like very. Like they're doing the work and they're just kind of bringing up what comes up. And so Mm -hmm. they start to notice the patterns of like, oh, well, why is my, why is my dad coming up? Or why is my mom coming up? Or why is this situation that happened here coming up? And so then we really try to start exploring it. Like, do you think it's related? Like, how do you feel like it's connected? Um, And you start Mm -hmm. to see those patterns. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. So I think you're already answering this question, but like, how does your work help with that or walk people through not feeling that anymore? Yeah, so I feel like the first part of of my work is really understanding that you're even experiencing it. Um, Sometimes my clients don't necessarily even know that they're experiencing it. Sometimes they come in and they don't even know what it is. But I think the first thing is really identifying that it's happening. Um, The second thing is recognizing that you're not alone in it. Because I think a lot of, or I know a lot of times that uh, people who experience imposter syndrome feel like they're alone in the experience, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they, yeah. there's this like big fancy word called pluralistic ignorance, which means that you very much feel like you're in it alone and that no one else has experiences the same thing that you do. But mm-hmm. imposter phenomenon is very much a common thing. Um, and even like, I think the, the number is like 70% of people experience it at some point in their life. Like it's a really high number. Um, mm-hmm. so I think that's this definitely the second part right recognizing that you're not alone in the experience and then finally it's really trying to figure out like where is this coming from how can we understand this more because a lot of times we don't have that self-compassion for ourselves we Mm. hold ourselves to really high expectations right you're trying to be a perfectionist you're trying to be like this person that's like double and triple checking stuff um but if we start to gain a little bit more of that self-compassion then we're not necessarily being as hard on ourselves. We don't have these like bonkers, um, you know, unrealistic expectations for ourselves because again, high achievers are very much those people. Mm, I see. Mm -hmm. This question is more out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. I wonder like, how do I explain it? 
if the person that you're working with is already having this experience of like imposter like i'm not really all that much or i don't know like i i don't fit where i where I'm, i don't belong here and then you start working with them and then you actually like face them with the reality that there is deeper work to be done mm-hmm. do you feel like that like pokes holes in their like a persona for a little bit like where it, it maybe even increases the imposter syndrome for a bit before like does it get worse before it gets better do you think yeah yeah definitely i think it's not about i don't think it worsens the imposter syndrome per se i feel, I feel like if anything okay. it might help the imposter syndrome a little bit because it's like oh everyone else experiences everyone else experiences it too it's not so lonely after all but i think it mm. pokes holes on the feelings because we can go about and this is something that i that i talk about in therapy with my clients is like we can go about imposter syndrome and figuring out imposter syndrome in two different ways because you know we can go about it the cbt way which is like let's figure out the thoughts the core belief let's try to challenge those thoughts let's create lists of all your achievements let's do all the different coping skills to just you know make you fully believe that you that you're not you know that you're not an imposter that you're actually a pretty badass person so we could go that route or we could go the deeper route, which is like, let's do EMDR. Let's figure out, like, where is this coming from? How is this impacted by childhood or upbringing or experience? And so when you go that route, sometimes, you know, it can bring up other things. I think when you go both routes, to be quite honest, because we're you're building connections to experiences in both in both avenues. And when you're building connections to experiences that may be traumatic or that may you know just bring up a lot of emotions if you don't have the right tools it's gonna feel very flooding or it's gonna be feel feel very overwhelming but i wouldn't to be a responsible therapist if i didn't teach those skills first Mm. right like we're not just jumping into these things and like just going at it (laughs) and like going at it we're teaching the skills and the foundations of like how do we manage our feelings how do we stay within our window of tolerance so that whenever these triggers or these connections happen, we're not immediately flooded with emotions? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that. Thank you for explaining that. And I hope that eases some of like maybe the um, uh, maybe anxious anxiety around, anxiety. you know, like yes. digging into. Yeah. Into yes. This. Because even like, let's say, for instance, we I start with a client and I teach them the skill. Sometimes they're like, no, you know, I think that was enough. Like, I'm good. And I've had that, right? Where it's like, you know, you you really just want to work on imposter phenomenon or imposter syndrome with work. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, let me teach you the skills. Let's go this route. Let's figure this out. Let's, uh, you know, get you to really get into a routine of like, let's celebrate those small achievements. Let's make sure that you're writing down all your accomplishments whenever you can. Um, even if they were small, let's, you know, really challenge those thoughts that come up whenever the feeling of I'm not worthy or the feeling of I'm not doing enough comes up. Um, and yeah. so you're really working on like certain things to be able to kind of just stay there. Right. But mm-hmm. if you're wanting to really build those connections, really understand what's happening doing those things we can go a little deeper it's really up to the client Mm -hmm. i imagine there are people that are kind of looking for the quick fix like i just want to feel better now like yeah Mm -hmm. so and that's okay right because sometimes you they they're not ready for it or maybe they're it's not even necessary right like maybe for them it is very much just work and it stays there and you know Mm -hmm. maybe they're able to move about their day after they've learned all the skills i see yeah Maybe this ties to one of the questions that the listeners asked uh, or wants to ask you, Uh, (laughs) which, by the way, if you don't follow the First Gen Healing podcast on Instagram, you should, because that's where I ask people for questions for the episodes that are coming up. But um, one of the questions was, if there is there a way to not experience imposter phenomenon anymore or is it something that will come up with every new experience, especially since we're talking about maybe like surface surface is i know it's still deep but like surface is level solution and maybe going deep so yeah i think it might fit in in, in this yeah part. i think that's a really hard question to answer because i feel like it's both yes and no like i think it just yeah. depends on the situation the person in, in general i've met people who you know and i've worked with people who work on imposter phenomenon and they somehow like have these like very and I love these moments where you're in therapy and I've had these moments myself personally too where you're in therapy and it all just kind of clicks and you have this big Mm. aha moment and you're like oh this makes a lot of sense and like I feel like sometimes that can be enough 
Um, whereas other people may like not necessarily have those aha moments and not saying that they always happen. Um, but you know, maybe it doesn't happen or maybe it, it just doesn't relate or whatever. And they're able to, to experience it. Right. And alleviate that experience a little bit more. And then they go on to the next big thing and mm-hmm. they're not, you know, very, they're not like the perfect people there or they feel like they don't have the, the experience and they feel like they're an imposter. And then that's when it com- comes up again for them. Yeah. Does that make sense? Ooh, that makes sense. Yeah. Because it, for one, it's a layered experience as you've been explaining mm-hmm. uh, this whole time. And then two, like some people, it might click and be a domino effect for like any other experience. And for mm-hmm. others, it might be like, well, these are new players, new character, new environment. So it's different. Mm-hmm. Right. And so mm-hmm. then it can feel similar as like back to a new experience of the phenomenon, the imposter. Phenomenon. For sure. For sure. Like, for instance, for myself, like I, I experience imposter phenomenon myself too. We did the first uh, podcast episode and and I've done podcast episodes before, podcast interviews before too. But I mean, the first mm-hmm. time I ever did a podcast interview, like I remember being so nervous. And mm-hmm. and uh, the first time coming back into like my work after like postpartum, that I experienced mm-hmm. the imposter phenomenon there too, because I hadn't been in work for about two years um, with these types mm-hmm. of interviews. So I think for myself, I'm noticing like, yes, there's a connection. Um, I've had those aha moments, but yeah, of course, like when I'm in a new space, when I, um, you know, do a new type of like work, um, then I, I'm going to feel those like uneasiness, but because I have those tools, then I know I can work through them and it isn't necessarily debilitating. And I think that's really something to gain from as well too. Like you can experience it, you know, moving forward. But you also yeah. have the tools on how to actually navigate those feelings so that it does it isn't debilitating. It doesn't impact mm-hmm. your decisions. It doesn't really impact the way that you perform. Or Yeah. Mm-hmm. Got it. And could you maybe tell us a little bit about why you decided to make it a focal point in your professional life? I imagine as a therapist, there's different areas that you can focus on, right? Yeah. So what made you lean towards imposter phenomenon? Because I fucking felt it. <laughs> Because I felt it and it was my experience and I was first gen and or I am first gen and um, I'm first gen in a lot of things right like it's I'm a first person Mm -hmm. to be an entrepreneur the first uh, generation because my brother also went to college but first generation to go to college uh, first generation born in the US Um, so there's a lot of like first gen experiences that I had where now as an an adult um, and and, and an adult professional too I go into spaces and I am sometimes the only brown person or I am sometimes the only person that, um, you know, has immigrant parents or like there's a lot of me being the only or the first or, or one of the few. And I think those mm-hmm. experience and those those experiences in themselves make me more passionate about the work that I do. Because I think it's important to really understand your clients. Right. And also to yeah. be able to have and have that lived experience but also have the knowledge and the studies of like what how to kind of navigate those feelings and how to be able to work through those feelings so mm-hmm. yeah I don't know I really love it I love it a lot it's yeah. it's really it's definitely a passion of mine and I I'm very blessed to to love the work that I do mm-hmm. yeah I think it's so beautiful because I think like it could be the difference between like continuing on into leadership, let's say for someone, right? Or stop or they're stopping their potential, essentially. It it could be that impactful. Yes. So, so cool. Yeah. Yes. And you get to see that, right? So imagine like being a therapist and like you're working through someone's insecurities in that way. And then you see like them actually like, like living up to their full potential or even just feeling confident in, in, in the role that they're in. Right. So like, let's say, for instance, they do have these badass roles and they feel like, oh, I don't know if I'm doing it right. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, yeah, I am a leader. Yeah, I have these. This is the reason why I'm a leader. These are the things, the skills that I have. This is what. And it's like, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yes. And like, I, I'm just thinking like with, you know, the people that I work with, too. So there's like this especially you talked about achievement oriented, right? Like mm-hmm. it becomes this empty experience in a way. They don't experience the depth of it when they don't feel like it's real or that they deserve it, right? So then they just go after the next one and the next one. But how beautiful that like 
feeling like you deserve it and owning whatever step or achievement you're at, which is, I think, like part of what you do. That's so cool because then you're helping people also que se la crean, you know, as yeah. you're stepping into the next thing. Yeah. Yes. And I think with that, too, is like que, que se la crean y que, que no se crean like muy, muy. Right. Because that's also a fear mm. of playing sometimes, too. Right. It's like, let me step into that power. But then I can't be too confident because then that's going to look conceited or that's going to look like narcissistic. And it's like, well, no, like, dude, you you worked your ass off. Of course, you're going to like, yes, mm. feel it. And so really starting to, again, that self-compassion is really key here, too, because yeah. we have such high expectations that we can't be these flawed people. Right. We can't. We need to be a certain way. And it's like, well, no, like you deserve all these things. You worked hard. Like your family worked hard. Generations before you worked hard. Like this is the reason why they worked hard. So own it. Yeah. yeah. And I think like we, without realizing probably as as a culture, sometimes we perpetuate that same like fear because there's like se humilde right mm. or you graduate or you buy a house or something is like ay ya te crees antes me hablabas there's these sí. comments no that like <laughs> yes and i feel like it's yeah. such a passive aggressive thing like but we don't like mm -hmm. i truly fully believe it and this comes up a lot too in in sessions where it's like i think we genuinely are very passive aggressive culture sometimes like we mm. don't know how to communicate or stay in vulnerability So it's easier to yeah. joke around about things, um, you know, to use your humor. And to some to some degree, it could be a strength, right? Like, I think we could be very playful beings, um, but we get uncomfortable in the uncomfortable and we don't know how to stay in those feelings. And yeah, like instead of saying, like, you know, I miss you because you haven't hit me up after you bought your home. Right. Versus, yeah. oh, ya te yeah. crees muy muy, ya no me hablas después de que te compraste la casa. Right. Yeah. And so it's saying, like, I'm proud difference. of you. Uh -huh. or saying yes <laughs> yes yeah. but we make like we make it about ourselves i think that leads me to the next que question which is what have you learned about the first gen community through your work i think uh some of the patterns that i've noticed and i don't know if if like i haven't really read any like that's the sad the sad unfortunate part about it is that it's really hard to to get into the research of things there's not as much research out there when it comes to mm. like connections with first gen and an imposter phenomenon or even first gen in general um it's very limited but i think that in the therapy room what i've noticed is that that core belief of i'm not enough or that core belief of i'm not worthy sometimes it is very impacted by our relationship with our parents right and sometimes our parents don't necessarily do these things on purpose right it may not necessarily mm. be like they treat you terribly or they you know, don't listen to you or they do certain things, it could be something as simple as like, my parents had to work two, three jobs and they went home. But as a little kid, you experience that as a world of like, well, I'm not important because my parents are home. Mm. Or I'm not enough because my parents are, you know, really pressing for straight A's. And right, like they have their mm -hmm. story of like, you know, they, you need to have an education, like they have, there's a lot of pressure on them. But it indirectly plays a lot of pressure on us as well, too, as first gen. And so, so yeah. much connections when it comes to our upbringing of, like, the expectations of the parents not necessarily fully being there, of the parents not necessarily having the emotional intelligence. And by that, I mean that they're in their, it, it's not, like, the education even. It's really, like, hey, like, I right. noticed that you were sad today. Like, let's talk about it, right? Like, yeah. we don't talk about feelings growing up. And so, as yeah. a kid... Sometimes you're feeling misunderstood. Sometimes you're feeling like you're an inconvenience. Sometimes you're feeling like, you know, you're not enough because you're not the, the good daughter or the good son. Um, and so those experiences can sometimes impact those imposter phenomenon experiences later on in life. Yeah, and I think, like, I wonder, too, I mean, um, parents dismissing or not, yeah, not validating their child's reality And so, for example, like, oh, this homework is hard. ¿Cómo vas a decir que esta tarea es difícil cuando yo estaba chiquito, tenía que ir a trabajar y también iba a la escuela? And so, automatically, your version of hard isn't good enough, right? Mm -hmm. Or sad. It's not good enough because they've lived through sadder things or harder things mm -hmm. or bigger things, etc. So, I, I just, like, thought of that as you're speaking. I'm like, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that uh, for, yeah. for first gens. 
Yeah, yeah. Even when it comes to just not like the performance, right? Like there's a lot riding on on the first gen's performance. And sometimes mm-hmm. indirectly, those types of guilt trips or those types of comparisons can indirectly pressure first gens to have to perform a certain way. And because of that feels like there's very unrealistic expectations because they have to get that, you know, multi-million dollar home or they have to, you know, get the really badass job or they need to have the six figures or the seven figures and they need to get their families out of pobreza or like whatever it is. Like there's yeah. all these different like pressures um, that happen indirectly. Like I don't think that our parents do it to be malicious at all. I think they're also kind of driving their life through trauma, right? They're they're experiencing mm-hmm. their life through their own stories and their own experience and may not necessarily have the insight or foresight on how the way that I just, you know, am in the world, how that impacts my child my child or my children. Yeah. And wouldn't you say too like comparison? Like just like we're stuck in comparison, sometimes I think our parents are stuck in comparison. So like mm-hmm. since they're living such a fast life sometimes, mm-hmm. it's like, oh well, what does it mean to be a good parent? Having kids that have straight A's. Okay. So then my kids have to have straight A's. Yeah. yeah, and you even see the the comparison firsthand, like, oh, por qué no eres más como tu prima? O por qué no eres más como this? Or, you know, like, there's a lot of comparison sometimes. And again, yeah. I don't think it's malicious. I think it's just, again, the drive, the fight, fight or flight life that they don't have the insight or the foresight to really understand how words can really impact mental health. Yeah. Especially, yeah. like, in those really early years hmm yeah right because you think about like those early years and your parents are your world yeah right? like you don't really exactly. care about i mean like your parents are your world and so whatever your right. parents say like that's going to leave a mark yeah yeah you take it very seriously like you to honor them you literally to almost meet their expectations mm-hmm. yeah but as little kids you don't necessarily know how to read between lines you don't necessarily know how to be able to let go of some of those things so you take things very literally and mm-hmm. you you hold on to those and those are the things that those are the building blocks to like how you're going to be the world like it's a very like attachment based kind of theory of mine but it's it's i see it mm-hmm. what are maybe three different things that people can work on from home let's say like of course considering your services but mm-hmm. what are other things that you can like sprinkle on as like knowledge or tips for them to um tune into one of the things that I share a lot is the shoulds, the need tos, and the have tos. Um, so when we say I need to go to the store or I should, I should have done this, right? Like there's um, almost kind of like this tone, como que se te está regañando, like you're reprimanding mm. yourself because you're using the should, the need to, and the have. Um, and so one of like the first sessions, when if you ever see me, that'll literally be your first lesson of like psychoeducation, like. The way you talk to yourself is very important here. Like you want to be able to reframe those. And so if you hear those words, the need to, the have to, or the should come out of your mouth, talking to, talking about yourself, then that's already like, you know, we got to shift that. We got to shift that language. So rather than, you know, I need to go to the store, it's "Mm, I aim to go to the store. The goal is to go to the store, right? I should have done my homework yesterday. Mm. The goal would have been to to do my homework yesterday, but I ended up doing this instead. Or, um, you know, I would have hoped to do this or I aim to. Like, the language really impacts it. Because if you think about and hear, right, I need to do homework. Tienes que, right? I feel like in Spanish, like, tienes que, there's no other option. I need to do homework. Uh, Versus the goal is to do homework doesn't elicit as much anxiety it doesn't elicit elicit as much pressure it doesn't elicit as much of that like guilt yeah exactly that guilt (laughs) and so if you think about that right if you're trying to learn self-compassion start with those it's it's a i feel like it's as easy and difficult because that's hard i've been a therapist for a really long time and that's still something that i sometimes catch myself saying because Mm-hmm. I mean, that's very common language, right? I need to, I have to, I should. Like, I should be doing this. Or I need to do that. I have to do this. Yeah. Like, I have to wash dishes. Something as simple as that. It's like, well, no, I want to wash dishes because that makes the kitchen cleaner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. Okay. That's, so that's a good one. tip. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that's one. Two, I would say um, 
another one I like to talk about is your list of badassery. So people talk about it as your list of like, you know, awesomeness or your list of accomplishments. But I, I like to say it because, you know, I like to cuss. But <laughs> your list of badassery. <laughs> your list le of da badassery. Un, le da un punch. <laughs> yeah, like cual, cualquier cosa, right? Like, and I think that we don't we don't celebrate small and big achievements enough and sometimes it feels very foreign to us because again we're not trying to be conceited or we're not trying to you know x y and z but here this mm-hmm. list of a of badassery isn't even something that you need to share with people it really is just for yourself so if there is this fear that you're going to be conceited nadie lo va a ver so no importa but write that list and it doesn't even have to be like accomplishments like, oh, I graduated college or oh, I d-. like it could literally be just things that you love about yourself. It could be things that make you badass. Like one of the things I joke around about when I do these workshops and I talk about imposter phenomenon is like I have that I have really bomb eyebrows in my list of badassery. Ooh, and, you okay. know, because I feel like, <laughs> OK, yeah. I feel very confident in my eyebrows. And if even if you tell me, like, oh, no, your eyebrows are not, like, no. You need to, like, go get them. And I'm like, nope, nope. I love my eyebrows. And I know my eyebrows are badass. So it is there. And it's one of those things that you start to feel very secure about. So anything you love about yourself, anything that you accomplished, anything that you, even pe- things that people have told you, like, you don't have to believe what they've told you, but maybe they've told you. Write it in there because it's still an accomplishment in itself. As you're writing these things down on your list, you're wanting to be detailed with them, right? You're not just saying like, okay. oh, yeah, um, my coworker told me I did a good job. No, like my coworker Becky told me that I did a good job with this uh, project that I worked on October 20 something where I did X, Y, and Z. And I, I resolved this issue using like X, Y, and Z. Okay. Right, like you're going okay. detailed into it so that when you read it, it like you can mm. really remember, you can really kind of, you know, connect with that. Yeah, so that it touches more fibras. So it's like, deeper, mm-hmm. a deeper yeah, experience. it's all about the body, okay. right? Like you're trying to, yeah. trying to feel yourself. You're trying to, you know, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the third tip about all this is that as you're doing it, you're also actually using it in the future. So whenever you do experience imposter phenomenon, Go over that fucking list. It's there for a reason, right? Mm. So you're going and you're looking through that list um, and you're really kind of coaching yourself through whatever scary moments, whatever, whether it's before like a big meeting or before a big presentation or whatever it may be, you're coaching yourself through it because you're like, okay, I'm noticing, feeling a little anxious, right? I notice in my body. I notice it in the way that I'm like, you know, feeling clammy or I'm second guessing what I'm saying, whatever. You're going to go through your list of badassery, coach yourself through it, maybe do some belly breathing, something to kind of calm the nervous system down before doing a performance or presentation or whatever. Ooh, okay, first gen. So, yeah, tienen su tarea. Number one, <laughs> notice how you speak to yourself and how you mm-hmm. say, like, notice the have to, should, and switch them up. And number two, list of badassery. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And number three, use it read it use it yes, yes read it go through it even in the moments that you don't experience imposter phenomenon it's almost going to be like your your little bible about yourself right mm-hmm. like you're you're gonna go and read through these accomplishments and it, the fun thing is that as you start to get accustomed to celebrating those small wins your list ends up becoming endless and it's so exciting like i've been doing my list for for a really long time now i think since like 2018 or 17 and like I'm like, ooh, let me just scroll through this list real quick. <laughs> like it's just really nice. Like you start to really yeah. get excited over like the things that you that you've done and you've accomplished without having to expect anyone else to tell you about them. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much for that list. My next question to you is, what have you learned about yourself through the work that you do? As a therapist, you're kind of trained to to be this like blank slate. Like, oh no, you know, you shouldn't feel or like you shouldn't be this person. Like. You shouldn't, right? You shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't. Um, But I think that as I've uh, gotten better at basically saying fuck off to everything I've learned (laughs) and being more confident in who I am, (laughs) I, I really enjoy the work that I do because I do see myself and my clients and I get really proud and I cry with them and we, we, Mm. we experience therapy in different ways and a different authentic ways. Um, And, you know, it's just really beautiful because it's taught me to be 
more confident in who I am as a therapist and the strengths that I have as a therapist and how you see me and how you hear me. That's literally how I talk in therapy. Like I'm not there to mm-hmm. be this person that like, you know, tries to pretend to be, you know, closed off or that tries to like be this blank slate. Like, I will yeah. go, oh, no, he didn't, or, oh, no way, or, like, you know, I will I will be there with you in that moment, and I think there's oh, something special that. about that, like, if you're able to yeah. speak Spanglish to your therapist, like, if you're able to be in that moment, um, if your therapist is able to, like, be that person for you while still being able to check you, because I'm not going to go and, like, play games either, um, right. and sometimes, you know, like, depending on the client, I won't check you, because I know that they need that person, that's there to be more nurturing, that's there to be more caring. And I can be that person for you too. It's just about knowing how to like meet your client where they're at. And I think that's not something that's taught. Like that's not something that like that comes with experience that comes with like owning who you are as a therapist. Yeah. That's Mm -hmm. so special because I think that a lot of this world is so transactional you know, mm-hmm. and like everyone is embodying their role, let's say. Mm-hmm. And so it's so nice that you're still complete, like you're still, I don't think like you're changing the way you are as a therapist, but it's like you're making it personable. You're making it person to person, right? Not yeah. like entity to, yeah. Yeah, entity. yeah. Because I feel like, you know, everyone talks about the client therapist relationship. And I think that there is a client therapist relationship. Like I try to keep it you know, very minimal. I don't really talk about my personal life or like make it about me either. Uh, Because I've had those experiences. Like it's so bonkers. Like I've, Mm. I've, I've been in therapy for myself. And like my therapist will talk about like, I will never forget when my therapist talked about her dead parrot and showed me pictures of her dead parrot. And I was like, how the fuck is this related? Like, what? so like if you're out there therapist you did a weird ass job um but yeah like I think it's just like you know you do things with intention so I'm not here like a lot of my clients need someone to be there to be that nurturing figure to be you know validating their experience because maybe that wasn't something that they had and fortunately enough I can be that person for them and I don't make it about myself um and we cry together, but I cry because I'm like, fuck, I'm so fucking proud of you. Like, and you should be proud of yourself. It doesn't even matter if I'm proud of you or not. Like, are you proud of yourself? Um, yeah. Because that's ultimately like the special, the special part of the relationship. It's like, yes, I'm proud of you. And yes, you know, these things are happening. But how do you feel about yourself? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is what matters at the end, right? Because one day you mm-hmm. won't be there, let's say, to cheer them on. So mm-hmm. they need to see it for themselves. Yes, and so we do definitely yeah. talk about graduating therapy and all that stuff mm-hmm. desde el principio también, because I'm like, you know, you're going to get to that point where you don't need me yeah. anymore. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you for sharing that. I think that that's beautiful. And like I said, I think like there is so many transactional experiences, you know, that it's so beautiful that you get to um, shift that for people. You know, it's not just one more. But... I have two more questions from the audience, from the listeners, yeah, and um, and then we'll wrap it up. So the second question we got is, how could environments change so that less people experience imposter phenomenon, or is it all internal? I think that in, uh, environments can change to minimize some portion of imposter phenomenon, such as, you know, having more BIPOC into these spaces, like having... Of course, I'm going to throw that out there, right? Like, if you have more people that look like you in these spaces, of course, you're going to feel like you belong, right? So, yes, environments can't change in that way. So, hire more BIPOC, you know, be, be, like, listen to your people, you know, go support a small business, like, go do your thing and help your community in that way. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we're just dismissing and, um, you know, ignoring these issues either, because they can also be something that just happens and impacts you individually, right? Like, that yeah. can help that aspect, but it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you see these people there, you're still going to compare yourself and be like, well, no, es que, you know, they did X, yeah. Y, and Z, and they did, and they have this, and they have that, and I don't. Because you mm-hmm. can have those people be in those spaces, but it, it could still affect you personally. That's so real. You know, when I when I read this question, I thought of like the similar like, okay, there needs to be more uh, BIPOC 
people in the spaces that we occupy. But then I was thinking like even just myself as a creator and other creators that I talk about, we're in already the Latino space, you know, and that doesn't stop us from comparing ourselves and uh-huh. feeling less than and get, yeah. Uh-huh. So, but yeah, then when so I, I think and this is something I even see, like, I think when I first started off as a therapist, of, you know, and then obviously Latina and everything, uh, I remember feeling that. But I think as soon as I built community and as soon as I was able to be vulnerable with my peers and, and even share that I had these experiences and even talk about these things and talk about like random shit. Like once you become human and they become human, mm. like it becomes such a beautiful experience and such a big community that you no longer are comparing. Instead, you're like cheering them on for winning and they're cheering you on for winning and it becomes super special. So I think it, mm. it you really do want to kind of create those spaces for yourself because it could be one thing that they're there with you, that there's more BIPOC in those spaces. But if you're not building community, then there's really no point. Yeah. Ooh. Barras. I'm just kidding. <laughs> those are parts right there. <laughs> Clip that. I don't know. I think it's La Platica they say that. Clip that. <laughs> <laughs> what beliefs do people have to work on to not feel imposter syndrome as much? Oh, I definitely brought those up, right? So, mm-hmm. like, I'm not enough. I'm not worthy. Um, maybe even I'm not. I'm not important, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so, when you're yeah. thinking about imposter phenomenon, not belonging, comparing yourself to other people, like yeah, those are the things that come up, right? Those are the core beliefs. I'm not enough because yeah. you're comparing yourself to other people, and those people are better than you, right? And I'm not worthy is like you don't even feel deserving of the things that you have, mm-hmm. right? Okay. Yes. Yes, yes. So pay attention where, like, what's, where do those beliefs come up for you and what spaces are you occupying that those beliefs come in? Is it mm-hmm. even, because I imagine even, like, in your own family, you can feel that with friendships, see. At work. See. Yeah. yeah, you see that. And, you know, I, I used to think that it was, like, maybe, oh, the, you know, the adult sibling, the, 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 the oldest, but it could also be the middle child feeling like the black sheep. It could also be the younger one that's like, oh, you know, like, they're ganging up on me because they think I'm the baby, like, because I'm the youngest, mm-hmm. right? But I'm also the, the only girl. And so I'm sure I felt, you know, I did feel those things when I was younger as well, too. But it's the matter of, like, when did you feel it? And, like, was there maybe an early recollection of you feeling those experiences before, those having those core beliefs in, in, in your upbringing, feeling like you yeah. weren't enough or feeling like you didn't necessarily belong? Yeah. Getting to the root. <laughs> mm-hmm. So before we wrap up, where can people find you? Where should they follow you and your work? Yeah, so you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Instagram. I still even got Facebook, girl. You can find me anywhere. (laughs) You can Google me. (laughs) Uh, I think I'm like one in two Lupita Martinez, um, but I'm the only Lupita Martinez MFT. Um, But yeah, Therapy of the Sun is my... Uh, business name I do actually have an intern now as well too an associate so we are expanding so I am training her to make sure that she understands and knows how to also work on imposter phenomenon she's actually already a very very amazing um, and intelligent woman herself and has worked with imposter phenomenon which is the reason why I hired her but yeah, so if you're looking for a therapist, you can either come to me, go to her, all still under therapyofthesun.com, uh, Instagram, Therapy of the Sun, um, Facebook and LinkedIn, also Therapy of the Sun. But yeah, reach out to me. I hope to have, um, I do have a couple of openings in uh, for, for individual therapy, and then my intern also has openings, but I do hope to... Um, at some point, uh, have some workshops uh, to really work on some of these skills uh, yeah. to really, you know, do it in a step by step matter. Um, this was hard, right? And I'm a human and I've been talking about these things for the past two years, but I've also had a toddler for the past two years and my priorities have changed and, and there's no shame in that. Yeah, no. But when you do put them out, let us know. Mm-hmm. I'll make sure to, you know, like add the link in the description and stuff. Yes. Um, because, yeah, this is this is such good information. I'm so thankful for your for your time and for you sharing all of this with us, because, yeah, I think like 
it it applies in so many scenarios you know and it doesn't have to be these huge accomplishments i know you mentioned like ceo but i know for example when it came to like becoming a manager it was like so intimidating you know and i felt like i had to be someone completely different to be able to Mm -hmm. like enter into that space and you end up just like dismissing these opportunities because you're like i'm not Mm -hmm. ready and so then you end up like needing like in your mind you've convinced yourself that you need to have more years or you need to do this or x y and z just to get that position yeah yeah Mm -hmm. so i i know that this information is super helpful and yeah guys go make make sure that you go follow her on her socials they'll be linked in the description and don't forget to also follow uh the christian healing podcast on instagram so that you don't miss the opportunity to ask super amazing latinas like lupita questions (laughs) about their expertise um because we're going to continue to do some part two so Thank you so much for coming back and anything, any last words for the listeners before we let them go? Just, you know, keep working on yourselves. Uh, You know, it is a daily, you know, it's not a destination when it comes to healing. Healing isn't a destination. So I hope that you really take that seriously, right? As we're continuing to grow, we're growing ourselves on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, agreed. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for listening and we hope you have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye.